Good morning. Let me introduce myself. I'm the moderator for today's webinar. I'm Dr. Chan from Faculty of Engineering Multimedia University, Cyberjai Campus. I'm the chairperson for Center of Funds, Devices and Systems, and my research areas are in the microelectronics and nanotechnologies, green technologies, and the developments of Internet of Things technology for emerging applications. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to welcome all of you to our Humanizing Innovations webinar series. Thank you for sparing us your time with us for our webinar this morning entitled The Future of Semiconductor Industry. To begin, semiconductor or microelectronic industry is a very important sector in Malaysia economy, contributing significantly to the national GDP and providing many employment opportunities for our countries in different job fields. The COVID pandemic has transformed the way the work and business going on and driven up the demand in computing devices such as computer and smartphones, which has increased tremendously the sale of the electronic industry. On the other hand, this dramatic increase in demand has squeezed the tech supply chain, which is aggravated by certain countries' lockdown as part of the effort to curb COVID spread. And it's a very interesting development right now in the semiconductor or microelectronic industry, especially in the midst of war between Russia and Ukraine. We are very honored that we have our speakers here to share with us their perspective on the microelectronic industry in Malaysia and some latest technologies that will impact the microelectronic industry. Our excellent speaker this morning, Mr. Tan Chi Eng from Amco Technology Malaysia. Mr. Tan will be sharing his views on the rapid growth of the semiconductor industry. Mr. Tan is Director of Power Products Business Unit stationed in Amco Technology Malaysia. His major role is executing business developments by providing good quality and cost-effective power products. He has over 26 years' experiences in semiconductor industry, mainly working in Motorola and on semi prior joining Amco. He's a professional subject matter expert of semiconductor packaging, process and equipment, has published more than 90 technical papers, including IEEE Best Industrial Paper and Award. He also experienced in managing large engineering organizations and continue developing aggressive business opportunities through technology breakthrough and effective resource management. In his past career, he held several titles, including Six Sigma Black Belt, Distinguished Member of Technical Staff, and Certified IATF Quality Auditor. Mr. Tan graduated from University of Kabangsa, Malaysia with a first class honors degree of electricals, electronics, and system engineering. From MMU, we have our professor, Dr. Ong Du Xing, from our Faculty of Engineering. Prof. Ong will be presenting his talk on power enhancement in terahertz gun diodes. Prof. Ong earned his PhD in electronics engineering from the University of Sheffield, UK, and his Master of Philosophy and Bachelor of Science honors in physics from University of Malaya, Malaysia. He's currently a professor at the Faculty of Engineering, Multimedia University. His research interest center on terahertz electronic devices, semiconductor device modeling and simulation, and modeling of novel low dimensional materials. Prof. Ang served MMU as a director of research management center, dean of Institute of Postgraduate Study, and vice president academic from 2008 and 2014. And since 2014, Prof. Ang has been serving as a resource person for higher education leadership and quality assurance training program like DIES International Deans, Cost Southeast Asia Region, Asians Train IQA and Asians QS Square, Asians EU Share Programs, DIES National Multiplications Trainings, NMT and Higher Education Leadership Academy at CAP IDC Malaysia Chapter. He's a Malaysian Qualification Agency, better known as MQA Accreditation Committee member and auditor. Malaysia Research Assessment, better known as Myra Assessor and Asian QA Association Advisor. He's a fellow of Institute of Physics Malaysia, IFM, Charter Physi Physicist of Institute of Physics UK, and Charter Engineer of Engineering Council UK. He's also a DAAD alumnus and Humble Research Fellow. Without further ado, let us invite our first speaker, Mr. Tan, our excellent speaker, to start his presentations. Mr. Tan, your stage. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Chan. Okay, let me try to share my screen.
okay. Um, okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, today I'd like to share um, the rapid growth in semiconductors in terms of uh, the market and also technology, right? Um, so the agenda of the sharing today, I will talk about the semiconductor market and uh, then followed by electric vehicle technology and market because that is the major growth now in the semiconductors. And then uh, I will give several examples and uh, a case study for some of the material and assembly uh, processes that need to be uh, developed with the uh, EV uh, technology. And then, uh, then uh, we'll go into understanding how to make uh, ourselves competitive in the market and then uh, and then how we can get a big win uh, followed by a, a conclusion right so as you can see the chart here actually show uh, two things one is the red line actually is showing the uh, year to year growth um is actually in the up down condition as you can see the range can be from minus 40 to plus uh, 50. um at this moment is at the 18 uh, percent growth right it's kind of up and down um but the blue line which is representing the revenue of a semiconductor actually is on a forever growing increasing trend right and as of uh, last uh, April this year, it actually exceeded the new record of uh, 50, 50 billion units, uh, sorry, $50 billion in that month of April, uh, which is a great news. And uh, the graph looking still, you know, increasing, right? And so if you look at, the, I think in the industry, I think everyone agrees that the, the future semiconductor growth will be still depending heavily on the electric vehicle demand. On uh, so the electric vehicle semiconductors grow is actually more than thirty percent is you know exceeded the uh, uh, global trend of a uh, entire semiconductor. And uh, if you look at the electric vehicle, in one vehicle they are. Uh, approximately more than 3,000 pieces of semiconductors uh, components right inside the car. Um, that's maybe inclusive of the autonomous, autonomous driving feature as well in the car. Uh, but if you look at the uh, basic structure of the electric vehicle, basically there is a, a first module is actually to pump in the AC current into the DC uh, battery pack, right? And uh, from this uh, major battery pack, there will be a DC to DC converter, which will actually supplying to a uh, lower uh, uh, voltage of uh, auxiliary batteries, uh, maybe a 12 volt or 48 volts, right, for uh, electronic uh, usage inside the car. But more importantly, the DC uh, from the major battery will be going to the AC uh, electric motor, right? So these are the three uh, functional block in the uh, electrical vehicle. So if you look at uh, one example of the semiconductor components, uh, in this case, uh, it's called a SOA flat lead. Uh, it's a much thinner and also a thermally enhanced uh, power discrete. So in comparing to uh, uh, same size of five by six mm footprint as uh, in the standard SOIC elite, it actually can improve the power dissipation by 47%. Um, so this package is widely used for medium power application and uh, designed for uh, low uh, on-state resistance and also high-speed uh, switching. Um, so the appli related application, including a battery protection circuit, our PC, our portable electronic, and uh, last but not least will be the EV uh, DC to DC converters, right? And uh, these are more examples, uh, options available in uh, making the power products. At the right-hand side, actually you can see uh, various uh, 
uh, interconnect uh, technologies. Okay, so interconnect technology apply after we put the chip onto the leaf frame, and then we can uh, put a copper clip connecting between the chip and the external leads. And we can also put the aluminum, uh, aluminum heavy wire bonding, wedge bonding, and the aluminum wire side can range from four mils to 20 mils size. Or we can put the more uh, fine wire uh, ball bonding or a rectangular size uh, wire, which we call ribbon. Or similar to copper clip, another type is the beam lead, right? And then on the left hand side, you can see a variety of packaging uh, uh, outline. Uh, you can see the SOA flat lead, but with the double sided cooling. Uh, the TO uh, leadless package, uh, the flat lead of uh, example PSMC or SOD123 uh, flat lead, a Gawin package for D2 pack, and uh, the power quad flat no lead, and also the multi chip module. So there are a big variety of options uh, available, uh, basically considering many factors, but one of the major factors will be the needs. In the application, right? And so, whoever own an electric vehicle, they will require a longer driving distance and also a faster uh, charging time. And therefore, the conventional uh, semiconductor material silicon was no longer suitable for uh, such an application uh, requirement. So the industry had to switch to an entirely new uh, material and the best selected at the moment is silicon carbide. So the silicon carbide uh, technology pro can provide 10 times a higher breakdown uh, fuel, two times higher of electron uh, saturation velocity, three times higher of band gap energy and also thermal conducti conductivity, right? So the benefit we get from silicon carbide will be higher efficiency, faster switching, improved cooling, and higher current capability. All are required by a better electrical uh, vehicle performance. But what comes after that in the semiconductor with this material change, there will be an entirely new uh, requirements in the assembly process, right? And some of the new assembly process need to be developed from zero and some need to be enhanced. Right? So example, with the silicon carbide uh, wafer uh, sawing, you know, we have a conventional full cut and step cut, but now we have to venture into ultrasonic cutting, laser cutting, steel laser cutting, and so on and so forth, right? And uh, this portion actually still under a very aggressive uh, development, right? And for better chip in the package now, um, the conventional epoxy or soft solder or even the solder print may not be sufficient. We have to go into a new uh, dye attachment uh, material called the pressure silver sintering. And uh, that has a micro or even nano technologies in that material, right? Okay, and, um, and for interconnect like a uh, wire bond, you know, um, in the past, we started with the gold wire. We have a pure gold wire. We have an alloy gold uh, from 99.99% to 99% purity. Then when the market price of the gold increased significantly, maybe more than 15 years ago, then the whole industry venture into copper wire bonding, started with a bare copper, palladium coated copper, and palladium uh, coated copper with gold flash and alloy copper and all these things. And then uh, then after that for memory product, which uh, is not suitable for copper wire bonding, there is a silver wire. And the first generation is the 88% 80, 80, purity silver with about 8% of uh, gold. And then that uh, percentage uh, increased to 90, 92, 95, 96. So a various uh, development uh, in the material followed by actually a comprehensive uh, assembly process uh, development. And of course, the clip, 
come with the different uh, uh, sizes, dimension, and design, right? And uh, and there are more examples of this uh, process step uh, require in the building the power products. Uh, and I started with the leaf frame and we have a different base material or design and even the surface condition. Uh, the dicer, I will give an example later on. And then we have for die attached, we have the stencil printing, we have the soft solder. And then, uh, then just I mentioned about the cinder press, right? And the chip, uh, you know, the Asian strength already improved from few hundred gram to few hundred kilogram, right? Um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the bonding strength required to fulfill a uh, better heat dissipation, electrical conductivity, all this thing. And then we, for uh, interconnect such as uh, wire bonding, uh, we have a ball bonder, we have a bash bonder, and also we have a clip attached, right? Uh, each one serves uh, the different uh, purpose and uh, with the associated cost. And of course, we had the molding, uh, and then there's a lot of uh, development in the molding material as well, halogen-free, copper wire compliant, and such and such. So each of these uh, machine or process will require development and optimization. And in semiconductor, we emphasize on such a example on the methodology. We have a Six Sigma DMAG, we have designed for Six Sigma, we have PDCA, you know, we have various of uh, methods that uh, require knowledge tools required and then uh, and then for uh, process window development we have uh, you know um, uh, utilization of statistical analysis uh, software such as GMP and Unitab whereby this software provide a uh, uh, very good uh, uh, features to you know they have an embedded uh, um, so-called models statistical model inside so we are just required to uh, uh, get obtain a, like a evaluation metrics from the software and we run evaluations and uh, and then we put in the data we put inside the software for analysis and then we get a conclusion from that right so uh, and and sometimes a certain project will require a lot of uh, evaluations and uh, you know uh, one project maybe is uh, one year uh, lab work in the university right example and uh, then uh, to share a story if you uh, semiconductor guy talk to you and he may question you what's your confidence level in your for your evaluation and he's not teasing you or he's not challenging you actually he's asking about uh, alpha level the uh, error tolerance you use in your statistical analysis so uh, normally we use five percent or ten percent that's the alpha level normally we so a lot of this uh, require a lot of uh, practice and learning and all, and execution, and uh, and most of the decision we make in semiconductor are data driven. So uh, the chances we make mistake is uh, much less because uh, most of the technical decision is driven by the data. Right? Now, uh, so how to be competitive in the industry, and that actually pretty much. Uh, depending on the most valuable company asset, which is uh, the people, the engineering competency, right? So the competent engineer will perform a lot of uh, study to uh, deliver optimum performance. Uh, basically, you know, uh, in this case, I'm just a uh, uh, piggyback to a dicer, whereby uh, in normal uh, cutting of a silicon wafer, you can see that the blade actually is rotating with very high rotation, maybe about 60,000 rotation per minute. And we allow coolant, right? And, and this blade is actually a diamond blade. So, and the table will move, uh, let's say about 50 mm per second. And for silicon, you can see for the silicon uh, wafer, uh, the picture at the middle, uh, the cutting uh, is very smooth and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and neat. But when we put in the silicon carbide, you can see a backside chipping. So the black color uh, represents some chipping happen, right? And then we can slow down the processing speed to uh, let's say uh, two mm per second, right? That is a tremendous reduction on the speed from a 50 mm per second to two mm per second, and uh, it help, but uh, 
but on, when we increase the speed to 10, then you still see the issue. But 2 mm per second is too slow. We, we can't get enough uh, output from, from that kind of speed. So uh, then for silicon carbide, maybe we have to explore ultrasonic uh, spindle, uh, meaning we vibrate the blade when we are doing the uh, cutting. And of course, the new method will require a new cost. Uh, it helps to increase the speed, uh, let's say from 2 mm per second to 10 mm per second. So it's always about um, the engineering competency to perform the optimization. Uh, normally, it's uh, between quality, speed, and cost. Right? And the person who win in getting the optimum uh, performance to the best level in the industry, normally he will gain the bigger share in the market, right? And then, as I mentioned, winning the competition is important. Uh, the market is huge, uh, but then it depends on how you're going to get the market share, right? And of course, I think we need a lot of focus on the customer and their application, understand their needs. And then in uh, production, we need a very cost-effective uh, manufacturing. And of course, not to forget the uh, built-in uh, quality. Okay, and all this actually will be uh, enabled by a competent engineering works, right? And of course, uh, the management is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, has a really good vision, uh, you know, investing a lot of uh, resources to do that. So, Engine competency development is, you know, always very exciting. I would say that it's like a fun ride on a roller coaster. And uh, just, I think I have a personal experience. I was, uh, I know, reading some article in the industry, and then I saw a Tesla, you know, uh, autonomous driving uh, processor. It actually come with a car, and the two very big chip uh, labeled there as uh, AI. At the, artificial intelligence chip, a very big chip on the board. Uh, that take up the space, maybe 20% of the board space is taken up by the two chip. Right? Then I met uh, one colleague and then uh, asked him about the uh, you know, artificial intelligence chip. Right? How, 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 how does it work? Right? And then uh, he took a piece of uh, A4 paper and explained on the paper how to uh, you know, neural networking, the architecture, not so much on the algorithm, but on the physical architecture. I felt like I have a fun ride on the roller coaster. And uh, my colleague, uh, he's uh, 58 years old. And the way he say, describe his uh, learning, he say, this is for personal satisfaction, not even uh, required by the work. But I felt that was an uh, exciting trip it uh, brought me and I'm still writing that now, but I will continue to explore right, personally as well. Um, so as a conclusion, I think uh, you can go to Google. Uh, a lot of uh, trend is showing uh, new records year by year. Uh, they're up and down, but overall revenue continue to grow. And we can see uh, new records all the time, over time. Um, um, I think even COVID, all this thing, uh, and you heard their cars uh, order cannot be fulfilled because shortage on the chip, shortage of uh, semiconductor chips, right, and components, right. So the market's there, and 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 uh, you only grow larger, um, and uh, you know, and together with the uh, market grow, there's a lot of uh, uh, challenges in uh, the technical. And uh, there are new requirements, new application, new breakthrough material. And with some of the new breakthrough material, there is a development requirement of a new assembly process. And a lot of time, even we invest a lot of uh, resources, we always come to some constraints. So all these things have to be, uh, you know, happen even with some uh, constraint here and there in the resources. Okay. and. Uh, and uh, I think I just share a, a tip of the iceberg on how exciting is the semiconductors market and also technology. Okay, and uh, um, I, I assure you the, the outcome, I think of a good engineering 
competent competency will be always the rewarding portion. And uh, I hope to see uh, more members, especially in uh, in the field of uh, semiconductor in Malaysia, especially. Uh, uh, we are really lack of uh, competent uh, engineers uh, to participate even more and more uh, challenges. Okay, that is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tan, for the very fruitful sharing. Our next speaker, Professor Ong from MMU. Let's hear from Prof Ong on his talk entitled Power Enhancement in Terahertz Gun Diodes. Folks, if you have any questions that you wish Mr. Tan and later Prof Ong to answer you, you may post them in the chat box and we'll address your questions towards the end of the presentation. Over to you, Prof Ong. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chan, uh, for your introduction. Uh, let me get my presentation slide ready. We just had a very interesting uh, talk from the industry uh, perspective, uh, change from the silicon technology, the mature technology to silicon carbide and also the challenges. Uh. So it's very interesting here. I want to share with you uh, just a very a specific topic on uh, power enhancement in terahertz uh, gun diodes. Yeah. So I will uh, briefly in, uh, share with you the background of uh, terahertz electronics. Yeah. Um, how this uh, gun diode is the working principle, and also uh, the proposed structure that I have here in my research work to enhance the power uh, in uh, gun diodes. Uh, sharing with you some result and analysis. Yeah. So I'll. Uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, give you the acknowledgement to my research uh, collaborator and also my students uh, who has together with me and uh, carried out this research work. Um, my research partner actually come from uh, Germany, Technical University of Darmstadt. They are the one who actually uh, initiate, asked me to look into gun diode uh, as a device uh, to produce terahertz. Okay, why is terahertz? Yeah? We also call this uh, terahertz spectrum as a uh, T-ray. Uh, basically, uh, we define that around 300 gigahertz to 3 terahertz. Yeah? So this T-ray is here. Um, at the moment, most of the electronic technology is around uh, up to maybe 100 gigahertz. Yeah? If you can see here, 5G, but we're familiar now, 5G is up to 55 uh, gigahertz here. And what mentioned by uh, Mr. Tan just now, uh, the electronics for uh, autonomous vehicle, yeah, the Electronic speed yeah, that used is around eight, uh, especially for sensor, yeah, it's at uh, 70 to 80 gigahertz. I also put down here, I think something that we're familiar, yeah, something we struggled with for the last two years. The the COVID virus yeah, is around 100 nanometer, so you can have the idea, yeah. So the terahertz is in between them. Okay. So why terahertz? Yeah, why uh this uh terahertz is unique, yeah. It's because one terahertz is about one picosecond um, in terms of the wavelength is uh, 0.3 millimeter. Um, the most important thing is the energy. The energy of one terahertz is just about 4.1 milli uh, electron volt. Uh, in the room temperature, the, temp uh, the energy is around 25 uh, milli electron volt. So it's very, very small in terms of energy. So terahertz wave cannot lead to any ionization yeah, in biological tissue. So it's a safe wave uh, for us. The second is a uh, terahertz wavelength is actually extremely water absorption. So we, if we use a, a terahertz and apply to our human body, right? It will be absorbed yeah, by our skin. So if it's, if yeah, terahertz uh, will cause harm, it will only actually limit to the skin level, but right? so far we, we don't know. Uh, the terahertz also, because it's a long wavelength, uh, it's also uh, longer than the visible and IR rate. Uh, so it's transparent to most draw uh, dielectric material. So it means that it can penetrate through paper, wood, plastic, yeah, and cloth. So if you have a, a cut and then you put a bandage, right, you can actually can use terahertz there yeah, to see whether how the womb is healing. Yeah, actually, uh, of course we can also use it to uh, do any many application or share later. The last one, the last uh, point that I want to show you the unique uh, nature of there is because. Uh, it's actually very sensitive yeah, uh, to certain molecular vibrations frequency. So we can use terahertz, right, uh, to check certain molecule signature, uh, especially when we want to check any explosion the molecule, like uh, showing this slide, the terahertz application. 
uh, I think many of you, if you travel um, to a different country, go to the airport, I think you go to this security check. Yeah, you can, uh, you go into a chamber like this. Yeah, they will scan you. Basically, they are using terahertz yeah, signal uh, that actually uh, because of the water absorption yeah, of terahertz, we can actually scan through you, frankly naked, yeah, uh, at skin level. So you, if you hide anything, it's easily uh, can be uh, detected. Terahertz also can be applied for uh, study of uh, biological imaging, yeah, uh, especially for medical study. Uh, like this case is uh, the green of the rat. And you can see that, that that tumor and no tumor is very clearly shown here. Uh, there are semiconductor because uh, this terahertz can penetrate through many uh, dry dielectric materials, including epoxy. Yeah, I mentioned by Dr. Tan, yeah, the epoxy that house the uh, semiconductor chip. We actually can uh, use it for industrial uh, semiconductor inspection. As I mentioned, uh, terahertz is actually absorbed by certain work, uh, this uh, molecular, especially in terms of rotation. Yeah, like the, uh, the uh, rotations uh, uh, frequency. So we can use it actually to find out whether uh, certain um, uh, container yeah, have the explosive uh, material. Lastly, of course, uh, Terahertz is in the very high frequency, so we can use it for high ultra high speed communication. So this is the uh, plot that to show that over the years, yeah, research is, has been carried out to improve the speed of the semiconductor devices or, or photonic devices, yeah, uh, for ultra high speed communication. And up to 2020, you can see they reached uh, beyond so 100 uh, or 120 gigahertz. Rate. But if you look at our whole appliances, yeah, our day, everyday life, we hardly can see any terahertz electronics that uh, or electronic that using terahertz source, yeah. Uh, in terms of a uh, uh, microwave, we know there's a micro mobile phone, yeah, or, or even infrared, yeah, the heater, if we need. But within these terahertz, there is no commercial products. Frankly, uh, the reason is because to generate the terahertz source, we actually need very large, uh, bulky setup either using optical or vacuum electronic, not semiconductor electronic, vacuum electronics, yeah, to generate a uh, terahertz signal at a reasonable power. So it's costly, and so very high power consumption. So this is a plot uh, to show that uh, uh, in terms of uh, average power, uh, output power of all the devices here, if you look at the vacuum, uh, the, uh, uh, vacuum electronic technology, right, we can generate very high power terahertz, yeah. So it's mainly used for scientific research yeah, and uh, specific application because it's very expensive. Yeah. If you look at the optical side, we have laser, optical palm molecular laser. And again, uh, the setup is huge. You need a big charger, you need a vacuum chamber and so on yeah, to create the laser light. Yeah. Uh, so, but it can reach to up to 10 uh, terahertz signal at reasonable power. We recently, there's a uh, uh, inventions of this quantum cascade laser. Yeah, it's a very uh, unique laser, uh, not uh, similar to the current laser used for optical communication. But this laser only able to work at very low temperature yeah, because of the very small energy of our terahertz signal. We look at this uh, pink color, solid state electronics. Yeah? When we try to uh, increase the the speed yeah, or the frequency, operations frequency of uh, electronics uh, devices, we found that the power generated by these uh, electronic devices dropped significantly and down to uh, in terms of micro watt. Yeah? So basically it's hardly uh, usable uh, for any application. Uh, another technology is photonics here. Uh, photomixer is a very established technology now. It mainly, although the power is small, it's stable, it's been used for many scientific study. I want to show you, uh, there's one of the study that I have uh, with uh, Technical University Downstart uh, using photomixer, basically using two laser with slightly different uh, wavelength. Uh, then we beat the signal and the bit signal actually is the terahertz. Yeah? We convert by the photo uh, conductor and then uh, change the signal in of optical to electronics uh, signal and then uh, using a uh, antenna actually uh, to uh, produce the terahertz signal. So I work with uh, technical UC Darmstadt to use this as a terahertz spectrometer to measure the bio uh, diesel content yeah, using our, the palm oil from Malaysia palm oil import. But this work has been pending because of the pandemic. So back to our today's topic, yeah, 
the motivations of this work actually is to enhance optical power to reach this uh, reasonable power for good application. So if you look at this graph again, yeah, we have if we want to have we are lack of devices, yeah, solid state uh, electron devices to produce terahertz signal between like 0.1 to 10 watt average power from uh, 300 gigahertz uh, to one terahertz within this string. You can see it's empty. Why? As mentioned by uh, the Ta Mr. Tan, yeah, um, the industry actually high demand for electronic for AV, yeah, autonomous vehicle. So the new generations of automotive sensor for automotive vehicle actually in the low band terahertz. So it means that we need to reach our electronic need to reach up to uh, 30, uh, 300 gigahertz or 0.3 terahertz. Why? Because we, we need sensor like this that capable to operate well uh, under bad weather. Yeah, and also at the same time, the electronic must be in the compact size they put in the car. Look at the current uh, electronic uh, solid state uh, terahertz source here. You can see again, it's an empty space yeah, in this region. You can see this is in terms of milliwatt. So from 100 milliwatt to 10,000 milliwatt here, there is no solid state electronics yeah, that can produce a, a terahertz signal in this range. And to reach higher terahertz uh, frequency, actually uh, now they're using uh, multiplier, frequency multiplier, basically using a terahertz uh, like Ganda Ayot or impact to generate the fundamental signal. And then we multiply the signal uh, using short, uh, short key diode in this case. But you can see once you multiply the signal, you have loss of uh, energy and then the energy actually reach below uh, like one uh, milliwatt in this case. So what is a uh, gun diode? A uh, gun diode basically is, is a transfer electron uh, device. Yeah? Uh, layman term, it's just a DC to AC converter. This is the basic structure. You can see just a layer of N-type semiconductor. It means that's a lot of electron inside this piece of semiconductor. Uh, there are two, uh, we have two contact layer, yeah, so that we can apply the bias across. If we just apply a DC bias, we can generate AC signal uh, inside this gun diode. So how this is going to work? Yeah, how a piece of same diode when we apply a DC, AC signal can create a, a DC signal can create an AC signal. Yeah, uh, we first have to understand what is transfer electron effect. We also need to understand how this transfer effect actually give us this negative differential resistance or negative mobility, uh, which can be used uh, to uh, generate this terahertz, uh, this uh, gun effect, uh, which produces a signal in terahertz. Unfortunately, this uh, uh, transfer electron e effect is not happen in silicon. So we have to move from a uh, group four sem uh, semiconductor material, silicon, to group uh, three, five semiconductor. So group three and group five semiconductor, we have uh, the most common one, gallium arsenide uh, and so on. Yeah, here I, I show you the electron velocity as a function of applied electric field. Uh, when we apply more energy to the piece of semiconductors, we expect the electron to gain more energy, to move faster, so the velocity increasing constantly. Yeah, when we apply more elect uh, high electric field. Unfortunately, this not happen in three, five semiconductor. Yeah, but it's also fortunately, we can make use of this to create uh, devices. At a certain stage, a certain uh, critical electric field, right? The velocity actually drop decreasing when we continue to apply higher electric field. Why? Yeah, we will answer this later, but this is the what we call the negative differential resistance. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to talk to you about quantum mechanics, so I'm going to use a very simple uh, classical idea to explain this, yeah, the le transfer electron effect. Uh, in free space, we have electrons that have a constant mass. Yeah, the electron have a constant mass. So when we apply electric field, the electron will move. And when the electron move, they create momentum. So we know the momentum will have energy. So we can plot the energy of the electron versus the momentum. And it look like this. It's a parabolic yeah? shape. In a semiconductor, when we have electrons moving in a semiconductor, the electron actually experience also internal force from different atoms at different Different, from different direction at different strength. So it's a very complex yeah, uh, situation here. And this electron, when they move in the semiconductor here, this internal force actually can be absorbed yeah? it's, uh, simply using the concept of effective mass. Of course, we, we can calculate this effective mass using uh, quantum mechanics, yeah? solving the Sconger equations and get the 
actual effectiveness of the electron. So if you look at semiconductor, the most simple uh, picture is this. Yeah, if from the parabolic, yeah, uh, for a free space electron, where the electron's energy and momentum change in this manner, change to in this way. Yeah, so there is one valley here at the center, and also upper valley. So you can see electron at low energy, they are sitting at this small uh, low energy val valley, and we have actually a very small effective mass. But when the electron energy increase because of we apply electric field, the electron actually can be transferred to the higher valley. And at this higher valley, the electron mass suddenly changed to a heavy mass. So the electron will slow down their, their response to the external electric field. This is the reason why the velocity drop when we apply higher electric field. Yeah. So we create this negative differential resistance. But of course, in 3D, yeah, the pictures look like this. Yeah, uh, this is the center valley. This is look like the electron in the free space, but at a higher valley, the electron has to travel when they gain a much higher energy from the electric field. So this is a concept, yeah, that of electron transfer effect. Okay, but the picture is much more uh, difficult uh, compared to what we know. Yeah, here uh, in undergraduate, yeah, I think there are some alumni and students, yeah. So undergraduate, what we study at low energy devices, right? The electron actually travel in this region. Yeah, so we can use a very simple diffusion uh, model to calculate all and derive all our equation because we assume electrons travel here only. But when we consider a high field uh, devices, right? We have to consider the band structure. We call this band structure, how the energy change with the momentum. And because of the crystal structure, they are having a, Different uh, relationship uh, for different different direction. So this is a uh, plot. Sorry for the zinc band structure for gallium arsenide. And in this uh, study, also I study uh, gallium nitride. Gallium nitride have uh, another structure called uh, versite structure. Yeah, it's look like this. Looks like hexagon. So you can see when we use some Scoringer equation to solve the band structure, we have very complicated. Yeah, but we know what we need to consider here. Yeah. So in terms of to study these electronic devices and to, uh, to design uh, the, the high power gun diode, right? We need to understand all this. So we use a very simple uh, four valley monocolor model just to cover the important uh, regions of the electrons in the band structure yeah, where they are moved. So this is called unlocker band monocolor model. Yeah. And of course, this band structure is calculated when the ap uh, atom and atoms are static. But in the room temperature, yeah, we have thermal energy. The, the atom will vibrate. The vibration of atom uh, will change the, the, the distance between them, the bonding between them. So this band actually moving. Yeah? So we actually use the concept of phonon scattering uh, to represent this effect. So we had to include all kinds of phonon scattering inside this uh, electron transport model. Yeah? Of course, lastly, to simulate the device, we want to make sure that when we consider the uh, the electron inside the gun diode, all the electrons have to move under the influence of the electric field. Also, at the same time, experience all kinds of scattering. When they dis redistribute over time, we need to recalculate their, their electric field inside the uh, same kind of device. Yeah? And then this, this uh, electric field will influence some of the electron, how the electron will move. This is how we can uh, study yeah, the electron dynamics inside semiconductor. Okay, so. Now come to a very simple picture. What we study here is this is a conventional uh, gun diode structure. We have two layer contacts that we can apply the bias, and then we have a transit region. Yeah, uh, I show you the basic structure as without the notch. Notch basically is the layer that is, is undoped. Yeah, so we can uh, create a high electric field in this region. So for this study, what I include is an extra layer, a delta doped layer, it means that the highly doped a very thin layer, which will actually modify the electric field profile inside the device. Yeah. So I calculate, uh, my students work with me, they calculate this uh, two structure, and then we make comparison. How this small thin layer, a delta can okay, Im improve the performance of the gun diode. Okay, if you look at here, this is the plot of current density uh, versus time. So when we apply a DC bias of two volts, we actually can generate the output, yeah. This, which is AC, yeah. So you can see with the uh, delta dope structure, we actually can increase uh, the current oscillation much larger. Yeah. And um, this is a plot. 
of the FFT, the fast Fourier transform of the current waveform, so that we can pick out the frequency. So you can see the fundamental frequency is can reach up to 140 uh, gigahertz in this case uh, for a 1,000 nanometer length devices. So if we reduce the device length yeah, from one micron to 0.7 micron, we find that we can actually achieve up to 262 uh, gigahertz yeah, with a reasonable uh, uh, of the, this uh, current peak to peak current. Okay, this is for uh, Garam Asnai uh, Ganda. Yeah. But we fail to reach uh, 300 gigahertz yeah, in this case. Uh, but it's but it can be applied for the current uh, uh, automotive yeah, sensor actually. So to move on because of time, yeah, I just quickly show you why yeah, why we can have this extra uh, power. Yeah, how we can enhance this power because of we have a slightly uh, high dope, a small layer, high dope layer here. So this is a plot because it's a mo mo uh, mo the color modeling. It's very powerful. We can actually collect all the information inside the device. So I plot the here based on the electrons uh, distribution, we can plot the electric field. The electric field for far as a function of position of the device yeah, over time. Yeah, over time, how the uh, electric field for far change. So I have not explained about the gun uh, effect. The gun effect basically is because the electrons moving and when they jump to the higher value, they slow down because of higher mass. So the, the coming new electrons moving at a far higher speed actually will power up with the electron that moving slow. So we create a bunch of electrons and we call this high, high field domain. And this high field domain that will travel across this gun diode is the one create the AC signal. Yeah, so you can see from here, yeah, we, we produce a high electric field domain that can uh, grow and also propagate across it. But the unique things about the structure with delta dope is we have a extra fast track electron that we can see. You can see here in this plot of velocity as a function of time and position. This is the slow track of electron, means that the bunch of electrons that uh, form the domain and move together when they move to the higher value. Yeah. Here, we also have the very fast track electron, yeah, which actually join together with the high uh, slow track uh, high field domain and form a bigger signal. Okay, so to achieve the terahertz signal region and beyond 300 gigahertz, we turn to gallium nitride. Why gallium nitride? It's just like silicon compared to uh, silicon carbide, gallium, uh, gallium arsenide to gallium nitride. Gallium nitride have operating at very uh, larger velocity, yeah. Uh, so with the gallium nitride gun ion, actually we can uh, we generate uh, we calculated here we can actually calculate up down to 500 nanometer or 0.5 micron devices of course this device is a wide band gap the device we need to apply a larger uh, dc bias up to 17 gig, uh, volt here as you can see this plot is a velocity operating velocity versus device length uh, with the result with and without the delta dope there's no much change no improvements uh, in the operating frequency, but you can see there's a significant improvement in terms of the current, peak to peak current oscillation signal. Yeah, but when we uh, calculate and estimate the power for this uh, gallium nitride gun diode, we found that the, uh, the estimate power can be up to 2.8 watt, yeah, with a uh, efficiency of 2.6% uh, at the frequency of 625 gigahertz. So actually, we, we meet our aim. So we are able to create a device, yeah, theoretically, of course. Theoretically means that the, the crystal structure is perfect, all the atom arrangement is perfect, so they can travel at the best speed, everything, yeah. Our best device uh, can be achieved by gallium nitride, uh, gun diode is 625 gigahertz, yeah, and we can achieve close to 3 watt. Uh, if we, uh, of course, the next uh, idea will be uh, try to uh, fabricate the device, yeah. Uh, hopefully the Dunstar group will work with me. Uh, we will try to uh, demonstrate this device physically. Uh, we will expect a lot of challenges, especially the uh, the purity of the crystal structure, yeah, the gun, uh, gun, the gallium nitride, yeah, uh, bulk structure, because we need to grow up to uh, at least half a micron, yeah. So there must be defect. The second thing actually is uh, the, the thermal effect. Uh, the thermal management is very important in Ghana because we operate the high uh, voltage and also high current now. So I believe the power will drop. Yeah, uh, we will not expect to achieve as high power as the ideal case. But I, 
even a drop of one order magnitude is still fall between this uh, target uh, window for me. So uh, that's all my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any interest, uh, any question, uh, I'm happy to answer you or you may email to me. Thank you. Dr. Chan, uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Prof. Ong. Thank you for the sharings on the this uh, terrace engineering. If there's any interest in pursuing the research or any discussions, you can direct to Prof. Ong. Hello, folks. We will have our Q&A sessions now, and our speakers, Mr. Tan, Prof. Ong, will be addressing your questions. Please post your question in the chat box. Let me check if we have questions here in the chat box. Okay, maybe I can start some questions to our speaker. First to Mr. Tan. On the supply chain disruption due to COVID, Mr. Tan, do you think this will be prolonged and what is the impact to the industry? Can industry catch up very soon and so that the supply demand will be back to normal or at least we can see our new cars we book are delivered on time? What is your comment, Mr. Tan? Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Chan. I think that's uh, bring up a very uh, interesting topic, right? And um, for a person who in the semiconductors, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, obstacles, um, uh, but uh, I think one important thing in uh, most of the semiconductor, uh, semiconductors company, we have the so-called the uh, uh business contingency plan whereby actually we still do uh, a lot of things to resolve the challenges right so initial let's say covid cases uh arise there uh, there were a lot of shutdown a, a lot of uh you know uh isolation and all those things so um i think in this stage uh even in and during that time i think they there were a lot of efforts uh, to maintain a, a more steady uh, supply chain uh, um, in, 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 in whatever manner uh, uh, affordable by the company, right? So um, some company even have their employees uh, live inside the factories so that they don't need to, you know, go back and, and then, uh, you know, expose to a COVID risk all these things. Um, but I think that time uh, not past yet, the challenges not past yet. I think um, if you look at the uh, uh, recent uh, COVID cases in uh, China, I think there's uh, the lockdown also uh, continue to uh, disrupt the, the supply chain. I think uh, of the of, of the so-called global semiconductors. But I think. Um, but the efforts are, you know, still ongoing. I think there are a lot of strategy put in place. Uh, as I say, uh, a lot of company, they have a BCP as a part of the uh, company operating uh, requirement. And I think the issue is uh, getting less. So I think my sincere advice, I think be patient. You'll be getting your new car soon, maybe sooner than you think. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. John. Thank you, Mr. Tan. I think so. we can have some expectations that the the shortage in the IC can be addressed soon. And I think for Malaysians who have booked new car with ISST, I think we are expecting soon. Thank you, Mr. Tan, for this uh, sharing. Okay, we have one question from the floor. The question from Mr. Eric. And uh, Mr. Eric would like to know what is the biggest challenge of the semiconductor industry to produce the silicon carbide IC? And what is the future landscape of the semiconductor industry in Malaysia? To Mr. Tan. Yeah, I guess that question is to me. Huh? <laughs> so, so I think the um, so the silicon carbide material actually has been uh, um, is uh, exists for some time, right? But utilizing that in the semiconductors, um. So the first challenge uh, we see is uh, making the wafer, right? Uh, uh, silicon carbide wafer. And I think 
that technology has been established. Uh, we are getting more uh, silicon carbide, mostly still at the eight inch uh, form, right? Uh, there'll be some company going for drop inch all this thing as well. So I think the first stage of making the wafers uh, done, uh, then I think the challenge now is in the assembly, and how we can uh, uh, utilize the wafer effectively uh, in the assembly process. So uh, that was one of the reason why I posted that in the, my slide earlier. The cutting of silicon carbide continue to be challenging, and but there are a lot of engineering efforts uh, being invested. So, so I guess, uh, uh, and then you can see uh, some major companies are, are pursuing uh, getting a better or more share in the automotive uh, market. I think some of them, they uh, will even buy a wafer fabrication plant. They, you know, able to produce a silicon carbide wafer, right? So the, the fair, I think a uh, fair amount of uh, investment uh, is ongoing and some already done. Um, um, just like anything else, I think it will require some development and you know optimization. Uh, that also been addressed accordingly. So I think uh, most company were able to achieve a uh, you know um, so called a uh, high volume uh, manufacturing HVM uh, capability maybe sometime uh, next year, right? But uh, I think that is uh, ongoing, right? Uh, and then I think the second question, um, uh, that was also one reason I want to share a lot of things hmm. in this uh, uh, session today is that you know, the, the semiconductors in Malaysia will require a lot of uh, competent engineers. The future is very bright. Um, so any engineers or even fresh graduate or, or any students, you know, that you know, look for a very exciting uh, career, very exciting works, you know, not, uh, you know, nine to five kind of job, uh, should join semiconductor. We require a lot of talented people. We are really lack of that. And I think I'm very proud. Uh, a lot of people are very proud to be, uh, you know, uh, one of the members in the semiconductor industry in Malaysia. I think Dr. Chan already mentioned, right? The semiconductor industry in Malaysia is famous in the world. We have a lot of competency. Okay. Uh, and then I cannot share the salary number, but uh, you were able to get what you dream of. Uh, mm. But be prepared to take up the challenges. And, uh, you know, uh, just like every job, we would need to love our job. and. And believe me, it's a very exciting job, uh, but the uh, reward is good. And uh, I think the future of semiconductor is bright, but uh, we want to make it brighter with more uh, you know, competent engineers joining the industry. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Thank you for very good encouragement and very good pros prospect share with us for young generations. So perhaps one conflicting some um, tendency here that we have seen there's a global recessions likelihood of global recessions due to the interest high due to high inflation so in your opinion will this slow down the growth of semiconductor industry the demand in near future or maybe in some years to come Okay, so I guess that question is so for me as well. Huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so I think uh, the the industry actually you can see uh, just at the chart I show. I think from uh, year to year growth, they look it looks like there's an up down kind of a cycle. Okay, in the past, that cycle maybe is four years, five years, or even earlier than that, ten years. But uh, this cycle now become more frequently happen. Uh, that I think uh, depend on many factors, right? Uh, example, uh, but but uh, is uh, some portion yeah is connected to the uh, economy situation right in the world or in in, in mostly in the world. Right? Um, uh, let's say uh, you know uh, uh, 
less people buying the mobile phones and then we can see the demand going down or not so many innovative features appear in the phone also can you know affect the sales of that and then uh, eventually it will cause some uh, downturn or anything like that right but i think for semiconductors most company i think are prepared for such a scenario right uh, so uh, so example for automotive we we are still seeing a very solid growth uh, basically even without increasing uh, purchase number of cars but the component electronic uh, component inside the car still growing exponentially right so mm -hmm. even without increasing increasing the sales but the semiconductor components actually uh, grow in quantity right in a way that you know bring uh, continue to bring exciting uh, you know, market to, 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 to us, to the, those uh, semiconductor companies, right? So, so uh, and, uh, but most company, I think, prepare for that. Uh, there is no such uh, thing as uh, no job to do or anything like that. And you can see the same chart I show with the, you know, blue line is always in the increasing trend. There are some one or two years, it looked like drop a bit, but you know, if you look at the full picture, it's, it's increasing. There's, there's no doubt that semiconductor continue to grow. And then uh, we, we are breaking records by records uh, all the time, right? So, Dr. Chan? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Tan. I think that's very exciting. We don't just have the demand in the ICT products, smartphones and computer. We also have the emerging uh, demand, especially in the auto autonomous vehicle which we may not see in Malaysia, but elsewhere we have seen there are so many autonomous vehicles being marketable. So um, that's very good news for us in the engineering field. And uh, another question to Mr. Tan before um, some other questions to pop on. Okay, perhaps this is uh, very interesting for the students. So Mr. Tan, you are from industry, from the industry expert perspective. Uh, what are the attributes that you pretty much hope to see in our new generations of engineering graduates going to semicon industry? What are the attribute characters that you wish to see from them? Okay, I think um, not only the, for fresh graduate, I think in, uh, in generally for any engineer, right? Um, I think there are a couple of uh, attributes which is important. Uh, they, they need to be independent and because the they're going to gain their competency through learning it's not by training right uh, put them in the classroom will not help right but they have to do a lot of uh, evaluation uh, you know start to build up their fundamental knowledge and then enhance that by doing a lot of evaluation all this thing now, all these things need to be done independently because there is no resources assigned to be guiding them full time. But helping them is, of course, uh, you know, most companies will provide that. But uh, engineers to be, need to be very independent. And then sometime down the road, when they face a lot of challenges, I think that comes the motivation portion, right? So, uh, of course, management will provide motivation and guidance, right? But an engineer either is experienced or fresh, or even myself, right? I, I need to have a strong self-motivation because uh, the challenges are exciting. Uh, uh, but you do hang on, hang on to it, and then uh, believe that eventually, uh, and uh, you will overcome it. And and in my experience, nothing is impossible. I, I I have not seen any issue that cannot be resolved, technical issue, right? So I, I think that is important. So a fresh graduate, when you are deciding where to go, join semiconductor, there's a lot of challenging uh, you know, issues to for you to resolve, for you to establish your competency. And then with the competency, that's where the reward uh, come accordingly. Right. So uh, that is my advice uh, actually to, to everyone. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Tan. I guess I think we get a hint from Mr. Tan that the, the career in the semiconductor industry is certainly very challenging. For those students having personalities that you like to pick up the challenges and uh, you like to think to solve the issues, yeah, join 
the shabby connector industry. And uh, first of all, of course, you will join the, the engineering degree, E and E degree programs. And so I think Mr. Tan has also hinted that the rewards, although he cannot share the numbers of figures, but will be certainly pleasing and pleasant and satisfying, and it will be exciting in terms of reward for years to come because we have emerging markets out there. We have the EV, we have also the emerging uh, demands in the computer, smartphones. Everyone are using smartphones. There are so many opportunities out there that the industries continue on a rapid growth. Thank you, Mr. Tan. These are the expert views from the industry that I guess our audience, our young generation will appreciate a lot. So to you, Prof Ong, I also prepared some questions. So coming to terahertz engineering, so I, I guess we have seen some simulations uh, uh, data in the slide that you have shown. So what is actually the bottleneck that the terahertz engineering has not been applied in the fabrications of the products? Um, first of all, of course, the, the, as I mentioned just now, the introduction part, <clears throat> the current electronics, right, uh, is, is limited because of the material properties first, um, like material like Garam Arsenite established material system for semiconductor. Yeah. Um, the, the highest speed yeah, they can uh, achieve actually is, uh, not able for, for, a uh, application for gun diode. Yeah. The highest speed we can go, uh, we can achieve about 200 as I show you. Theoretically, it means that it's a perfect crystal, perfect uh, condition, yeah. Um, because it's a uh, limited by the material properties, yeah. There is a certain uh, drift velocity that we can achieve uh, for us uh, uh, by uh, as a function electric field. But for gallium nitride, it's a very high. Um, uh, we can achieve a much higher in terms of uh, drift velocity, just like silicon carbide. Why the semiconductor industry had to move from silicon to silicon carbide because they want to achieve higher output uh, power. So similarly, uh, for this case, yeah, we move from gallium uh, arsenide to gallium nitride. The the challenges of a uh, gallium nitride is again is the material problem, like what uh, mentioned by Mr. Tan, right? When you try to saw the silicon carbide, you have to face some challenges. Uh, similarly, for to grow gallium nitride, right? Uh, you you want to grow a pure uh, crystal is is challenging. Uh, you have to deal with the, all the defects, yeah, happening there. Uh, even though you, you, you get a good uh, crystal, when you want to fabricate it, you will face a lot of challenges also in terms of metal contacts, yeah, in terms of uh, uh, all the fabrication processes that we have, yeah. Um, so it's a new set of problem to solve, yeah, just like silicon carbide. Um, so uh, for me, I can't see the, 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 the product maybe in the next few years, it's not possible, yeah. Theoretically, I think what we can do is, uh, at least we know there's a promising, there's a potential there then we will pursue it uh, rather than just try and error. So to me, theoretical study uh, is very important, a strong foundation uh, in the fundamentals of physics, yeah, for semiconductor is very important uh, for students, yeah. Especially when it come to understand the defect yeah, in semiconductor, most of the students, are not, they are not able to relate that the, the defects come from where unless they understand the physics behind uh, the, the devices. So I, I think uh, there's still some way, journey to go yeah, before we can see uh, there are electronics uh, in the market. Thank you. Prof, thank you, Prof Ong. I think that's a very good perspective sharing on the terahertz engineering. Of course, the radical study, the simulation modeling are necessary. These are one step ahead before the implementation. It can save the cost for the industrial implementation of these particular technologies into the real device fabrication. That's where the modeling simulations and theoretical studies their importance lie in thank you prof ong and uh, perhaps the questions is more technical but now i have some questions uh, for prof ong in the capacity as a auditor for myra and also the mqa so my questions to prof ong here in the capacities of assessors uh, national level assessors prof ong can you maybe describe the role or mission from the university in supporting the semiconductor industry. Since we have Mr. Tan from industry here, perhaps I think Prof. Ong can share a little bit about this, how we can support the industry in terms of talents, cultivation, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, first of all, we, we know Malaysia um, in terms of the engineering, yeah? uh, we are actually part of the Washington Accord. So our engineering degree in Malaysia actually is recognized worldwide. Uh, all the member in the Washington Accord. So we had to keep to the standard, yeah, 
uh, every few years, yeah, or, or maybe up to five years, uh, there will be a team auditor come and to uh, check on our university, um, beside our own EAC audit. Yeah, so this is very important to make sure that our graduate actually able to perform. Uh, to to me, engineer is is there to solve problem. Yeah, uh, so if you can't solve problem, so you're not an engineer. Yeah, uh, so to, to for us to produce a, a graduate from the beginning, uh, year one, lay down the foundation. Uh, lay down all the necessary uh, essential knowledge that you need and then so, uh, year two they start to develop skill especially in our uh, our lab work yeah almost all our subjects have lab work either theoretical or experimental uh, to have to give you hands-on experience for that particular topic uh, year three we have the capstone project yeah year four we have final year project so all these actually is are very important to to train the student to be an independent problem solver and this is what the industry need so uh, to me, um, keeping up the standard is very important. And one way to keep the standard is to work with the industry. Like now, we have an engagement with the industry. So uh, Mr. Tan know our graduate. Yeah, they, they come and interview our graduate. They will give us feedback directly whether our graduate is able to perform, able to solve the problem. Uh, what are the gaps that we have to consider? Uh, how to, to revise the syllabus and so on. Uh, and another thing that I think the university uh, always uh, came out is a benchmarking. Uh, we always uh, try to benchmark with uh, other university that is uh, in terms of quality in terms of reputation much better than us to look at their syllabus to look at their uh, way uh, they conduct the deliver their program in, in, including assessment and of course we also engage external examiner yeah to give us directly a uh, feedback about our exam questions yeah our uh, assessments uh, method and so on uh, whether we're meeting the standard as per their standard yeah? so i think these are all the measures that we have put in to ensure our graduate eventually uh, is fit for the purpose yeah, to be able to deliver uh, a solving problem for the industry. Yeah, I think Dr. Chan, I think this is uh, what, what I think we are currently have. Uh, of course, I'm an MQA assessor, I'm not an EAC assessor, uh, but I think uh, the, the concept is the same. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Fong. I think that's very good elaborations on how university can serve the missions to push the industries and also um, in terms of talent cultivation, as what Mr. Tan has mentioned, I think we have a shortage, not only the shortage of the IC products, we also have a shortage on the good engineers. And that is where our contributions and at, from MMU, I think we have our programs up to the, the day and then so equipped with the facility, as well as we have good collaboration in the industry, uh, which support us. I think AMCO is one of the industries that support us. We have Mr. Tan from AMCO here joining us. I think that's how we can gain the, we can reduce the gap between the, you know, industries and the engineering students. We can prepare them to fit the industry demand. Thank you, Prof. Ong, for good elaborations. And hi, folks, we are near the end of the webinar. It's 11.45 now. As a conclusion, there's a plenty of room for further rapid growth of semiconductor industry, despite several challenges with many emerging applications, for example, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, like what mentioned by Mr. Tan, and more internet of things, technologies and applications, and even green energy technologies. The unavoidable chip shortage has drained up the demand and sales of industry. And just like Mr. Tan has shown, the curve is going up. The curve is still going up. And therefore, many industries are on expansion. As a result, we need many engineers to come in and more importantly, we need more students to join engineering program after the middle school study to build the talent pool so that we have enough engineers to supply the industry. In MMU, in our engineering faculties, faculty of engineering in CyberGI campus, and we have one in Malacca, faculty of engineering technology in Malacca campus, we have several engineering programs which meet your career ambitions. Our electrical program, pure electronics program, electronics program majoring in telecom, computer, and our new program, robotic automations program they respectively all of these programs are integrated with state-of-art technologies elements and one of the examples of these advanced technology has been presented by prof ong which is the terrace engineering i believe is a future technology for semiconductor industry when there's a breakthrough in terms of the device fabrications and we we are the only two private universities in the country while involved in the SEAP program. And SEAP program is known as Structure Industry Apprenticeship Program, a program by Ministry of Higher Education, which mandated MMU to develop and nurture the industry-recognized integrated circuit engineer from our undergraduate programs. 
So this, I believe, will serve the missions of Malaysia to feed the semiconductor industry with talents to ensure the sustainability of this ecosystem. So guys, if you are excited to join the semiconductor industry, we welcome you to join us in your university journey to become a professional engineer, embracing into a very challenging, very exciting semiconductor industry. Please feel free to get in touch with us to explore more information regarding our signature engineering programs and which we strongly believe our program will meet your career ambitions. At the end, Mr. Tan, maybe one last point to take away for our audience. Yeah, please join semiconductors. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Uh, Prof. Ong, you have any last message to our audience? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chan. I, I always like to uh, quote MU tagline, inquire, inspire, innovate. Yeah, I think uh, just now uh, uh, Mr. Tan mentioned he had to motivate himself. Yeah, it's a challenging world. Yeah, it's a very uncertain world that's out there. Uh, but we can always yeah, apply these three I. Yeah, the inquiry mind. Yeah, we always ask questions to understand. Yeah, but we also need to uh, motivate ourselves by inspire ourselves, inspire our team to work together and to solve problems uh, by great innovations uh, uh, together. So remember, practice the three I, inquire, inspire, and innovate. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ong. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Thank you, Prof. Ong. I think you have very good sharing here. I think all of us appreciate a lot. And uh, before I end this webinar, I would like to thank our speakers and uh, faculty of engineering, MMU CyberJI campus, as well as the organizer of this webinar, the Industrial um, Collaborations and Engagement Center, ICEC, and our Research Industrial Collaborations and Engagement RISE divisions and uh, also strategic marketing, emissions and recruitment smart division from MMU studio and the technical support team for making this webinar conducted smoothly and exciting. And at last, most importantly, thank you to audience who joined us today. And uh, every one of us, take care and stay safe and have a nice day. See you again. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>